My name is Dan Gilmer. Um, I work for Ancestry.com, as you were saying. Uh, our main headquarters is actually in Provo, Utah. Um, we have an actually office in San Francisco, and I actually live in Austin, so I'm like the team of one down there. Um, also, I'd get a shout out for Anthony Williams. And, um, he's actually our uh, our DevOps senior DevOps engineer, um, so he's going to be fact checking me the whole time as I talk. Um, I did a talk about, I guess it was about two years ago, just talking about like kind of our struggles with Chef and Windows, because um, that it wasn't exactly a, a known quantity for Chef at the time. Um, in fact, my boss yesterday talked a little bit about how we were the kind of the first ones to have a private Chef instance. Um, and we had a lot of struggles of trying to get a lot of the cookbooks that were oriented towards Linux to actually work in, in Windows land. Um, so kind of went through a little bit uh, about two years ago, and I'm kind of here today to kind of talk about what, we're gonna, what we are actually working on now and things that we've progressed and what we've learned. Um, from feedback from developers. Um, but to understand kind of where we are now, we have to, I kind of have to come and say where we were. Um, first of all, we use um, continuous delivery or continuous integration. Um, all at the time, or actually currently right now, we only have a couple of legacy stacks that aren't in a pipeline for code deployment. Um, as you can kind of see here, this is kind of a snapshot of one particular pipeline that I have. Um, called the stack is actually BIP underscore API. Um, way that kind of works is uh, um, this is with a developer view, and they go in there and they say, hey, I want to be able to push some code out to production. So they check something in to get, and immediately this system then notices that something has changed, and then they can progress it up the pipeline, and as you can kind of see there in the last stage, it's production. Um, Kind of the biggest, uh, biggest thing for us, we had about a year and a half ago, we had a um, 1940 census push, and it was kind of a big deal for us. Um, and we had one particular stack, uh, they pushed in one day, I, I think it's upwards about 20 times, but they kept getting to like our integration environment and then failed, so they had to start over again, and they make a change, they get to the acceptance environment, and then they would fail again. They start again, they get to the pre-production environment. And then at that point, yes, it worked. So they got it to production, and then they found another problem. So they had to start the pipeline all over again. So of the 20 iterations, they got maybe about two or three um, production pushes. Um, but that was great for them because they could iterate as fast as they could, and there wasn't any like roadblocks in the way. That was kind of our first success story of um, integrating our, our chef um, deployment and also uh, configuration. So just a little bit more detail exactly how that works. Um, so as I was saying, pipeline is first started by code, um, first checks in. Once that's done, um, the pipeline they compiles and tests the package, and then it puts it inside of our repository. Um, at that point, we kick off a custom knife um, uh, plugin that we have, uh, we just call it deploy, um, which then searches for all the servers in a particular chef role and also environments and grabs a subset of ser servers and then iterates through them um, and says, hey, run chef client against all of them um, uh, based off the, the, the search result. Um, at that point, if it's, if it's a server as Linux, then obviously it runs a particular type of cookbooks. And if it's Windows, then it runs different other set of cookbooks. Um, and, then, and then within, once the uh, chef runs within the cookbook, then it searches for basically what I call an ERID, enterprise release ID. That's the version that comes from Go, or in, I guess in case of Jenkins too, is like this is the um, this is the, the basically the check-in number uh, of the code release that we're trying to do. So we store that within Chef. So the cookbook from the nodes point of view says, hey, what release am I supposed to be converging on? And then also what role am I am I in? So I know I need to know what, how I behave or how I get configured. Um, and the next stuff is that then the cookbook searches for the version of a particular data bag to load into configuration. So at this point, we, we use a lot of uh, data-driven cookbooks. Um, so with that bit of information, then it immediately searches within our data bags and says, oh, this is the stack I'm in. Um, this is the version I want. Pulls down a JSON file. And then it consumes that data, and then it knows how to act. Um, the last thing it says, then um, Chef acts on the data with a version data bag. So here's kind of some examples of how we set that up. Um, on the left here, this is just a typical role. Uh, we actually don't, we, <laughs> I have to give you a little bit of caveat real fast. Is everyone does everything differently. In fact, the people we're talking about during lunch, um, they do it exactly opposite the way that we deploy our code, which is fine. Everyone does it differently. This cat can be skinned like a million ways. 
And this works for us in our business. I just want to kind of give you an idea of what we do and then maybe take it back and maybe use a little bit of what we do. Or even, honestly, tell me afterwards, like, hey, did you think about doing this way? Because quite possibly, we were kind of, we, we first started this, we were like the first ones out of the gate, and we just met all of our requirements and we kind of went with it. So anyway, so roles. We kind of don't use roles role really a whole lot. Um, basically, every single one of our stacks, they have exactly the same three cookbooks in it if they're Windows. And then for if they're Linux, they have a different three cookbooks, just change the Win to a Lin, and that's pretty much about it. Um, we do use environments, and this is an example on the right-hand side. This is the buoy environment or the build environment. And then you can kind of see there with all the different default attributes, we have basically stack ID underscore ERID, and then the version. The version comes from our Go. Our, uh, that's the version of code that we really want to be like deployed. Um, the next part of the way that we used to do things, uh, on the left-hand side is kind of an example. These are the Call them, these are our data-driven cookbooks. So the, 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 actually the six there, the ACOM, Lin Config, Lin Ops, Lin Sec, Win Config, Win Ops, and, and Win Sec. Uh, we actually broke it off a little bit so we didn't have a little bit of a turf war. Um, so we had the security teams. They own that cookbook. Whatever's in there, they define what was in there. If they had to do some security lockdowns, they define what it is and they throw in that cookbook. The Lin operations for our operations teams. Because technically at the time I was actually in, I was a developer. You know, I was on the dark side, I guess. or the, I don't know which side you want to be on, but I was, on the, I was actually a developer at the time when we did this. So, so we wanted to give operations a little bit of a, hey, this is your cookbook. You can put anything you want in there. If you want to disable IP6, great. We'll throw in that cookbook. And then uh, the last one is actually the configuring, um, the config cookbooks. And those are actually ones that consume the data bag, and they know, then know how do they act. So every single stack actually uses the same cookbook. We don't have a cookbook per stack. So we have about... 200 plus stacks, so that means we don't have to maintain 200 different cookbooks. We have one cookbook. Um, and then, as you can kind of see at the bottom of that, we also have like, um, I call these the static cookbooks. Those are just like typical, like, hey, I need to install like Subversion, I need to install Ant, I need to install Apache, I need to install Java. Those are very static ones. Um, those ones that we can also work with in Vagrant, but I can talk about that later. Um, on the right hand side, this is the typical um, JSON, so within, I'm sorry, within our data bag. So the data bag is actually EMT, EMS data. And within there, we have a bunch of data bag items. And now this is a, when we first compile the code in the pipeline, we make a artifact, um, which would be like an RPM per se. And then we also create a JSON file dynamically with a version basically on the name, and then we throw it up to the chef server. So then we can match it on a particular version. Now let's actually look and see what's inside this monster. Um, this is just the top half, and it's very, very flat. Um, it's basically name value pairs. It talks about like the ACOM package, and you can kind of see there that's a nice find and replace value that we look for. It actually, this is where we store our recipe lists, and we have Windows features and whatnot. Um, in fact, I can show you a little bit more. Yes, I am running Windows. Um, so this is kind of a bigger example. Sorry, it's not the kind of have to squint if you want to look at it. But basically, it's very flat. I mean, we got IIS settings. We have F5 settings. If it's enabled, if it's not, what's the pool name? What's the core number? Um, we got health check information in here. We got basically pool tokens. So we know what credentials we should be using for like the different environments all the way up to prod. Um, we have transforms. That's a Windows thing um, where you can go in there and you can change the wiconfig based off of transforms. Um, down here, uh, we also have if Splunk's enabled or not, and also some other metadata information by like who modified it. Look at there. So I can see it. Um, <laughs> was it was it up there? Yeah, I don't know. Um, well, you have to believe me. So to kind of extend that, it's very flat. It just kind of goes through there. I was kind of showing it, every single IIS setting and whatnot. Um, if not, you can come up and I can show you the actual JSON format in a minute. Okay. Um, and then also, whenever we had to hit this very flat JSON file, uh, unfortunately, an, an, a ticket had to be created. It was very annoying. So we have a lot of tickets like, hey, I want to upgrade from .NET 4 to VOR 5. Or I want Java, a new version of Java. I want that updated on my servers. Um, across the board, always be a ticket. And then we would always kind of be drowned in tickets. And we were like, 
This is kind of annoying, but we didn't want to enable the developers to have access to the JSON files quite yet because they, JSON is just hard to manually edit. And also, they didn't know all the keys also, so the key value pairs. They were kind of made up a little bit, um, so they didn't know exactly the syntax that they needed to put them in. So we kind of kept that close to, our, close to ourselves for a while. Um, but on the other side, we had to deal with tickets, which is not a bad deal. Um, the other thing that we had is, I was kind of talking about before, is uh, we had very hi highly customized cookbooks. These, uh, these two cookbooks um, uh, that I was talking about before are quite large, and they're quite in-depth because we have to be able to handle all these different primitives that we kind of made up. Um, and also, we created a lot of, we recreated a lot of the custom or common cookbooks, like Subversion. Notice there, I have Subversion, I have Subversion underscore Linux. I know, we tried. Um, but again, this is when the community was not really around, and uh, we just kind of did the best that we could at the time to get it working. Um, and even we rewrote our own Sava, uh, Sun Java JDK cookbook. We just wrote it from scratch because we didn't like the, uh, the community one because we, have to, we can't pull from anything outside of our data center. We can't go to the interwebs to pull anything down. So we're just like, ah, forget it. We'll just do our own. Um, Yes, this was the good idea from a year and a half ago. Just go with it. Um, and also, we've noticed that we had a lot of out-of-band changes on servers. So even though we had this great configuration, we could build a machine up from scratch reliably, comparably every single time, operations still needed to patch. Um, we, the developers still needed to test something. Um, services still needed to be restarted. Log files still got, you know, we needed to delete or they needed to look something on hand. And even in some cases, we need to install, because the, the company deemed we need to install applications that we weren't quite ready to have a new cookbook done, so they just went ahead and pushed it out, and it kind of annoyed us. Um, and kind of our philosophy is, this is our philosophy is, I, I'm pretty happy if I spin up a brand new server anywhere and no one ever logs into the dumb thing through SSH or WinRM for the life of the box. Um, no human intervention on a server, that means we've done our jobs. So right there, we've kind of failed because it was happening. Um, and also, the last thing is uh, system patching. You know, you can kind of see a blurb of an email that we used to get every morning. Hey, by the way, these are the servers that we're going to be patching today. And the bad thing about it is that we, we believe that the pipeline needed to have code and also configuration tied in hand. So if you never needed to roll back to version 1.0 from 2.0, and 1.0 had like Java, old version of Java, and this particular code level, we could, because we, com we combined the actual um, configuration of the server to the code that gets deployed. Um, so if we're doing patching or some other stuff, quite possibly they never checked that these patches actually worked in the build environment, integration environment, ACC environment, PPE environment, and the production environment. And nine times out of 10, they just went directly to prod and forgot to do the patching in the other environments. Um, that's just kind of how it ran. So now I can talk about kind of where are we now. This is the fun part. So we kind of learned from our mistakes and we actually talked to a lot of the developers and said, what works, what doesn't? And uh, one thing that they came back and said is the pipeline's a little bit long. Because um, we had a build environment and we had the, the, B, the BUI environment um, for the sole purpose that Chef was new and we were still trying to learn exactly how we integrate and configure these servers. So we had a place that it's kind of like a sandbox, a test bed. Um, we're actually in the process of moving that build environment to like Vagrant and also running on a particular dev server. So, you know, everyone has, you know, eight gigs of RAM and all, you know, eight cores and I'm like, hey, we'll just throw that on their dev box and we'll use Vagrant with the same cookbooks and they can have that build environment. They can iterate through that thing all day long as far as I care. We don't have to use RM structure um, to actually do that. Um, so the first thing is we have the package. We do the acceptance, and then we have the pre-production. Notice prod's gone. That was one thing that we kind of lost the battle a little bit. Um, we still, they, the, a lot of the, um, the feedback that we got was that they wanted, everyone wanted to deploy a little bit differently. They wanted some of them to have a smoke instance. Um, some developers wanted to have like an AB subset. Some of them wanted to actually roll out some new code and let it run uh, for a couple days before they committed to the full code change. 
Um, they wanted to have a smoke environment also in there, a canary push. Um, they wanted, if they had 20 servers, they wanted to roll out three at a time. I mean, the variables just were all over the place. It was really hard for us um, to manage that. Um, in fact, whenever they came up with a new deploy method, because we actually, at some time, we actually, we made changes to our knife stuff to handle all that stuff, but that means that they would have to then create a ticket, and then we would have to assign an engineer, and then we would actually have to make the change with the configuration on our side. We're like, we don't want to do that. We want to give it to the developers. So, um, and another thing that we did is that we moved um, the actual ERAD that, uh, from the environment to the actual role. And the reason that is, is we started getting conflict, is we were getting more and more stacks uh, on this new system we were actually getting saving conflicts with our, with our private chef server. Um, because it's just one, in the environment, it's just one huge monster JSON file. So we'd pull down the monster JSON file, we'd make one change to a version for ERID, and then we would save it back up to the chef server. And then quite possibly, we would have another save going on over here, and then it would conflict. Um, so we didn't know that that's kind of how it worked behind the scenes. Um, so after talking with chef a lot, we just decided to move that information actually into the role, and then we expanded it a little bit. Um, as you can kind of see examples of, uh, of our chef stuff here. So instead of just being, this is an inversion that we have in our particular environment, now we actually track all sorts of other cool stuff, like what's the batch size that we want to push it out? What's the batch, what batch type do you want to do? How many numbers do you want to throw? Um, what's the current versions in ACCPP and prod? Um, we actually have job IDs now because we have an agent that runs like production pushes now by itself. And then also it keeps track of all past roles. I think we keep track of about 15. So we can actually look at a history of actual roles that's happened. So with that structure in place with the environment, this is our new, kind of like this is our production push system. Um, we actually hand it over to the developers. So again, no, no tickets. Um, so the first thing you can do is you can actually look up their stack ID in the top left hand side and then you can kind of pull back some meta metadata. And then you can kind of see within, with making um, API calls to Chef and some of our other stuff that we have, you can pull back and you say what current version is actually in production and then what's the now, the new version that's ready to, that's been approved in the pre-production environment to actually go. So they can go in here and they can change the batch size, whatever they want to do. If they just want to do custom, they can go in here and they can click different, they want, they want to put it to the first three nodes, they can just say, hey, deploy this particular version of the first three nodes, and then they hit complete, and then immediately, actually the little play button there, and then immediately it gets deployed. So we did take it back from the deploy pipeline, we just gave them a better tool that they can have access to, and they can have a better visibility of what's in production. I mean, any developer can look at this and then say, hey, what version is on each of their servers, um, if it's in the big IP or if it's L4 enabled, if it has static checks, it goes through here and does static checks. Um, it tells you what version numbers on there and also deploy status. So if there's a current deploy happening, they can actually see the status on it. So the other thing we did is, I was kind of talking before, the JSON attributes are very flat. Um, we actually converted everything to now um, more objects and arrays. Um, you can kind of see here, you know, for, for the first thing, like custom PowerShell is one of, we call that basically a primitive. Um, then within there, then we can actually throw commands, path, and execute before configuration. So if we want to run at the very first. Um, and these are again key, key value pairs. Um, you can kind of see an example of like how a service gets set up. We have the name of the service, what, what, what package that came from to, for the code to deploy, install path, um, code path, what's the executable. Um, if it should be run underneath the AD account or not, we have the tokens all there ready to go. Um, so we basically made it so it's a lot more structured and, and in some cases, <laughs> we made it even worse if we actually had to go in there and manually edit. So that was our next project, is that we then created a stack configurator for all of our recipes. So again, this is a view of, for the developers. Again, so we don't have to have an OMS ticket, no tickets for us. Again, they can look up their, uh, their stack ID and immediately brings it all up. And they can go through here and say, hey, these are the recipes I want installed. And so in this case, they install MSMQ, PIC tools, um, C++, um, uh, 2008-210, uh, Rubit Handler, and it has .NET 4.0, looks like, for this stack. 
And they can go in there and just add more recipes. It brings back all the recipes. If they want Subversion installed, they want Visual Studio 2012 installed. I mean, there's a huge long list of recipes that they can install in there. Um, the next thing there is Windows features. If you're familiar with Windows, you can go in there and say, hey, I want you know, ASP.NET or Telnet client installed or whatever. They can pick it. Again, they don't have to contact us for this. Um, for the next thing, for F5 settings, um, they can go in there and then they can change um, their, uh, oh, sorry, this is IS settings. So the site name, pool name, install locations, basically anything you would ever want to change within IIS, it's there, even app pool settings. And if you want to run the app pool under through certain credentials, you can even put that in there. Um, F5 settings, you know, if it should be in the VIP or not, if it's true or false, what pool it should be put in, um, so on and so forth. Because whenever we deploy code, we immediately take it out of the VIP, and then we deploy the code, we test it internally. Once it validates it with the SLA, then we throw it back into the VIP for deploys. Um, this is the SLA. If, if people don't want to be that rigorous, they can just disable it. Go figure, if someone wanted that. Um, and then other, other stack configuration stuff. Um, uh, so I, you know, I can read through these. These are all the different like SLA paths. These are the transforms. Um, if Splunk's enabled or not on this particular environment, or if we have global stat, which is kind of like our version of New Relic, if it's enabled or not. If it's enabled, then it immediately starts, just starts doing it. Um, and then, uh, so basically we gave it over, the whole configuration of the stack, we gave it directly to developers. Um, and the next thing is we are starting to shift, uh, shift to community cookbooks. Um, now the cookbooks are pretty, they're actually pretty robust. Um, so we've actually, a lot of our stuff that we did by hand, we're actually wholeheartedly just kind of taking it and deleting it and bringing down a community one. Um, and then what we do is, I give you, this is kind of a code on the left-hand side, this is a primitive called attributes that we wrote. That's, again, if you define it within that JSON file, it'll actually run it. And then we can, within the JSON file, we can override any default attributes of any, of any community cookbook that we download. So again, it's fair, we don't have, to, the point was we didn't have to touch any of the community cookbooks. If we touched it, that means we had to then fork it and we had to maintain it. It's just, because we didn't control the upstream, it was just kind of a pain. So instead, we just always handle just the, the overrides. And the overrides, then, again, are defined within our stack JSON file. And that's kind of an example of that. And we even handle it per environment. We can override particular environments or we just have a global override if you look at the code. Um, the next thing we're doing is we, we modified our, um, we're actually in the process still of high, uh, modifying our highly customized cookbooks. Um, uh, we are still 80% Windows, but we are 20% CentOS. And uh, there's a lot of uh, push right now to move a lot of our services to Linux, which is great. So we're getting ready for that. Um, in doing so, uh, we didn't want to have two cookbooks anymore. We we're actually in the process of moving them into one cookbook that if you run this cookbook with these parameters with this in JSON file, if it just happens to be a target use, is Windows, it'll just do Windows stuff. If the target just happens to be Linux, it'll do Linux stuff. So if we point it to Windows, it'll just install IIS. If we point it directly to a Linux box, it'll install Apache. Um, so instead, we also broke out kind of the main things like uh, ACOM config, ACOM web server, web server, any services, so daemons or NT services, or even features um, that we want to install. So we're breaking it out, and we're doing a lot more um, uh, lightweight resource providers and also heavyweight resource providers. Um, and uh, another thing we're doing this is that we're getting ready for Chef 12. Um, so we're looking at the best practices, and we're making sure that we're going to be forward compatible also. Um, we're also looking at a lot of the OHI um, seven plugins that just barely came out. And, uh, and also another thing that we didn't do, which we should be doing or currently doing, is we're moving a lot of the OI functionality because we don't use like 90% of those attributes and it takes up a lot of time during chef runs. We want chef runs to run fast, so oh, removing a lot of OI functionality actually will help us out. Um, and also doing more custom report handlers, um, chef reporting server and uh, chef actions. Pretty much if you were in the room before for me, a lot of the stuff that is the stuff we want to start working on. Like we want to track um, like when a chef runs, like when it first starts, hit an event, and when it ends, hits an event, so we can keep track of run times. So then we can see if run times start like increasing, we know there's a problem, get that gray area. So we don't immediately 
it's not failing, but we kind of watch like, hey, something's kind of wacky somewhere and then we can kind of track it. Um, and, uh, and another thing that we're doing is uh, we like to switch uh, to push jobs. That's another thing that we're working on right now. The um, way it works right now is we have a custom knife plugin that logs into WinRM. And then from the WinRM session, then we kick off Chef Client. Um, it works, um, but we want to get to the point where we actually have the Chef Client actually running as a daemon or a service on Windows or Linux. Um, we were, I was, actually, I had a, there was a lot of contention during this decision. Um, I was a little bit, a little bit scared that if we had Chef always running every five minutes, that we would converge off some spec that we weren't aware of. We wanted to make sure that the pipeline as it ran through each stage made sure that when it was ready to go, then we would actually kick off the Chef client, as opposed to a Chef client always running and then looking for any changes, and then it would then make modifications. We want a little bit more control. But I think that we have the understanding a little bit more now um, that our next step is, is actually pushing in push jobs once we have a little bit more stable current production uh, uh, private chef. Um, we're going to be switching to that. So we're going to be getting rid of our WinRM, WinRM interaction and also our SSH interaction. Um, as you can, I had a little note there. I actually copied this directly from Chef. Uh, push jobs is a feature only in Enterprise Chef server, so no open source there. Um, another thing that we're doing is uh, Chef Run uh, for Windows patching. This is actually just something that just barely finished last week. Um, so this kind of tells you there's actually two parts to it. It was kind of tricky. We, were, we wanted to get the patching out of the hands of humans, and we wanted to get in, basically give the developers more opportunity to define when they could patch, and how they want to patch, and what they wanted to patch. So if you can kind of understand what I'm doing here. So on the left-hand side is during the knife, de uh, sorry, the knife deploy stage, um, it connects the server, and it runs Chef Client. And then it actually checks to make sure, hey, is there a reboot that's needed? At that point, then immediately does a reboot and waits for the machine to come back up again. That's kind of key. And then we add it back to the big IP, because we don't want to have a machine that's in a reboot state and actually be active to outside traffic. And then it exits out. So during that chef run, uh, we remove it from the load balancer. Um, then we, we, is this server being patched? We basically have an override, because some stacks don't want to be patched yet. So we just say, hey, yes or no? Is this a patching server or not? And then we add to our SCOM server, Yes, SCOM 2012. And then uh, we add that actual machine to a group called when servo is patches required. So inside that group, um, our ops department actually moved a bunch of like, these are the ones that have to be there. And then we immediately added that group. And if the JSON is defined for last month or newest, um, they can within that JSON file I was talking about before. Um, and then we add them to those groups also, the same node. And then we force the local SCCM client to converge on missing updates. And then we wait for, basically, we just run a PowerShell command called get software update compliance. And it just looks for if there's any patches that need to be done. Um, that's always like the biggest problem for me, because sometimes if it hasn't been patched for a long period of time, it could take 30 minutes on a chef run. That's bad. Um, but the way that we figure is that if we have, if we're doing, you know, one or even once a week, a chef run on a particular server, that time should drastically be reduced or even not even be there. So it's, it's kind of the trick of if you don't run Chef a lot, you're going to have a really long Chef run. But the more you run Chef, it's going to, just going to be faster um, after that. And then immediately after that, we clean up. We remove it from all the different compliance groups off of the uh, SCOM server, um, so on and so forth. And it, it seems to be working pretty good right now. Our next step is actually Google reporting um, to actually know when servers or Chef hasn't been run on a particular server for more than a month. And we can get a report, and then we can notify the owner. Again, all automated. So what is our end goal? Why are we doing all this stuff? Um, are we trying to automate ourselves out of a job? And I actually got asked by a developer a little while ago, because I kept saying, oh, we'll just automate that. Oh, we're going to do that. We're going to give you access to that. And he kept asking me, I was like, well, what are you going to do next? Um, if, if you give us access to that, what your current job is, what are you going to be doing? You're like going to like put yourself out of, out of a job. I was like, no, that's the wrong way to think about it. Is, if I have to automate something or I have to like, do tickets, whatever, I'm going to give that. If I have to do the same thing more than twice, I'm going to automate that and give you access to it. So then I can do more interesting and cool things. I can figure out what I want to do next. I can look in the future. 
Because if not, I'm just worried about what I'm trying to accomplish that day, or what, or what tickets do I have to accomplish in a particular day. And I'm not thinking about what I want to be in six months, or reading about what the new version of Chef will do for us. Um, so really, I'm not automating myself on a job. I'm just trying to keep myself happy. So I'm not doing repetitive things. Um, one configuration, two operating systems. That was the very first. That's kind of our biggest hurdle right now is because we kind of had diverging ideas on Linux and also Windows. And right now, we're trying to converge into one. Um, kind of the saying, saying I like to say is, uh, I treat our Windows servers just like Linux. I mean, in my mind, they're exactly the same. I spin them up. I configure them. I deploy code to them. If I don't like them, if there's anything wrong with them, I destroy it. I don't care. I'll just spin up another one. And the same thing for Linux, well, Windows and also Linux. I treat them exactly the same. I shouldn't RDP or I shouldn't be SSHing into any machine. Um, to be able to move into the cloud. That's another reason that we're doing this. Because um, our end goal is to be able to move to like AWS or even Google um, Cloud um, GCE. And uh, so if we have our full configuration of a stack in source code, I can take that configuration I, and I can deploy it. All I need is an IP address. And I can deploy it out to AWS. I can do it to Rackspace. I can do it in our internal Hyper-V environment, to our ESX environment. It doesn't make a difference. It's all within source code. I just check it out, and I run it through our system, and I can deploy a perfect server with the correct code in anywhere I want. So we can be very agile where we want to push our stuff. Um, and cloud is actually possible at this time. There's a, a term. We actually were up talking to AWS um, about a month ago, month ago, and uh, they were asking us if we wanted to do a lift and shift. I never heard that term before, but once I heard it, I'm like, that sounds like a bad idea. So instead of actually shifting all of our junk from one place to another one, we'll just be like, hey, we'll just recreate it. It's not that big of a deal for us now. And that gives us the ability now to be able to go anywhere. Um, even high of disaster recovery. That's kind of like, that's kind of the new project that I'm working on this year. I, I got to be honest. I was actually in development, and I went to the dark side. I'm actually in operations now. I got, I got pulled over. So I don't know if now development's um, dark side. I don't know. Some side. But I'm in operations right now, and uh, that's kind of the big push that we're doing is high building is disaster recovery. Without doing all of this work, getting all of our stuff in Chef and in code, I mean, all of our infrastructure is all in code, it, it's really hard for us to do high availability. Um, to, be able to, skin up, uh, to be able to spin up like 10 servers and then say, hey, we don't need this capacity anymore. Let's go down to two. Or even disaster recovery. Hey, we need to have another data center. Or forget that. Let's not even do a data center. I, let's just go to the, the East Coast or even Ireland and AWS, and I'm going to spin up some servers there for a new project that the customers there. So hey, we'll just spin up like 30 servers there. Once the project's done, we'll just shut it down again. Uh, disaster recovery actually makes it so it's possible um, and actually doable and actually cost effective in that house. In that house. Um, oh, auto scaling. That's one of the big things that we've done this for. If we had to have a server that someone had to build by hand, there's no such thing as auto scaling. But now that we have like Chef and all of our deployment stuff, I can spin up and I can spin down based off events or um, whenever the company actually deems it necessary. So that's about it. Is there any questions, jokes, or anything? I kind of went a little fast. Yes. Go ahead. Yeah, go. <laughs> what do you do to manage uh, environmental hardware? So, so in environmental, that, that was always the big question. So for Windows, I'll answer, you want two parts, Windows and Linux, or you just want Windows? Okay, Windows. So Windows, we have, the, they're called transforms. If you Google transforms um, from Microsoft, so we, we actually said, hey, within your package, and for Windows deployable units, we use a thing called NuGet. Um, with that, we, we say you need to actually define, as a developer, all the different uh, transform config files for each of the environments. So you actually have like preface, like buoy web config. You have ACC web config, production web config. And then within that JSON file, we define the names that's within their package. And then through our, our uh, lightweight service provider, then we grab that information and we run it through the transform tool that came from Microsoft and then it transforms the web config based on the environment that it's in. Because Chef knows, right, from the node's point of view, I'm in, this, I'm in the production environment. I can query that. I can query that right off the Chef server. So I know where I'm at from a node's point of view when the Chef runs. And I can act. 
Yeah. Yeah. But again, developers need to know that. Now we just give them the standard. They can figure that stuff out, and then they can iterate through the pipeline. No, no tickets for me. And then for Linux, um, that's the same, same thing. So we actually package in RPMs for Linux. Um, and then for Linux, we actually use external. We actually tell them we have certain places for Linux with RPMs. When they actually deploy the, the war or whatever, then they can, we actually have config files that has been defined that they need to have available within their source code that we pull from. So it's all standards at that point. Everyone does exactly the same. There's no like one-offs. Anything else? That's correct. I'm sorry. Yes, yeah, stack is defined as one deployable unit or one package that gets deployed, like a war file or a NuGet file or like a .NET update. That's correct. That's correct. But again, developers are very brilliant, very smart. They can figure that out. We give them all the tools so then they can have, they can self regulate within themselves to make sure that you know they're v1 v2 compatible on their apis or whatever and if they're doing things correctly they should be backwards compatible and that's another standard that we've worked with the different architects to say look when when you push out like a v2 of your api make sure v2 once v1 is still available and then you go through a deprecation process and you let everyone know via the wiki and after a certain time then they can de decommission it or something but they can push code out as, as fast as they want so it shouldn't matter Uh, no, it used to. I mean, about two years ago, we just did a huge blob roll. I mean, it was mass hysteria. We'd have like 30 like stack groups and they would all be pushing at the same time and then one of them, one of the pieces would die and then we would have to roll back the whole blob. Now everyone has an ability to pretty much run to production. They just have to get authorized. Instead of just them pushing out, they just have to contact basically him and then he says yes and then they can push the magic button. Um, but because we can iterate faster and there's not a big blob anymore, we make one change, very smaller, very small change. But we can do it any time. Instead of having a blob of 100 changes, we have like one or two changes go out. So if it failed, we know exactly how to roll back. We roll back really fast. That's another thing that we made sure we had. I don't know if you saw them within that configuration for deployment. They can just change back, roll back one version, hit apply, and immediately they roll back. So it's within like just a couple minutes. All right, jokes? <laughs> One minute to spare. <laughs> okay, I think that's it.